Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing lumbar spinal stenosis. We'll first define what it is, we'll then talk about how a typical patient's going to present, and also how you rule in lumbar spinal stenosis. So first of all, what is lumbar spinal stenosis? Well, remember that each vertebra, regardless of where you are on the spine, has a vertebral foramen. And when you stack all those vertebrae on top of one another, the sum of all those vertebral foramina yield the vertebral canal. And when you go down to about L1, L2, it's spinal cord within the vertebral canal, and below that the cauda equina exists within the vertebral canal. And so that vertebral canal needs to have enough space to accommodate the spinal cord and the cauda equina, not just at rest, but also with particular movements. Okay? So there could be certain processes that actually narrow the vertebral canal. It could be osteophyte formation. There could be spondylosis, so osteoarthritis, disc desiccation, and a number of things could narrow that vertebral canal. Now a couple other things. When any region of the spine, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, goes into more flexion, that actually tends to create more space in the vertebral canal. In other words, the vertebral canal gets a little bit wider, a little bit more diameter, and more space to accommodate the spinal cord. When you go into extension at any region of the spine, cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, that actually tends to narrow the vertebral canal. And so there's less space for the spinal cord. And if you're in the lumbar spine, certain regions, also the cauda equina. So now let's consider a patient that has lumbar spinal stenosis. There is narrowing of that vertebral canal in the lumbar spine. So now we intrinsically have less space regardless of position. Do you think that patient is going to want to be in a position that narrows the canal even more? Or are they going to want to be in a position that opens it up? They're going to want to be in a position that opens it up. And so most of these patients will present as some degree of bent over at the hips and flexion at the lumbar spine. All this other stuff we'll go into as we go through the video. But for now, understand this positive shopping cart sign. This is a position you get into as if you were leaning on a shopping cart. It doesn't mean you're actually using a shopping cart. But if you did see someone like this in the grocery store and they were just bent over like that, it could just be relaxing. Okay? Uh, but oftentimes if the individual is older, it's because they feel better in this position. This position of hip flexion and a decreased lumbar lordosis, so increased lumbar flexion, actually open up the vertebral canal and create more space for the spinal cord to sit in. This is what's called a positive shopping cart sign. So coming back here, there's a few other things I want to mention before we go to the next slide. So the posture, flexed at the lumbar spine and the hips. When we say lumbar flexion, that also corresponds with decreased lordosis. Decreased lordosis at the lumbar spine. So that's lumbar flexion. And they also maybe flex at the thoracic spine, maybe some hyperkyphosis at the thoracic spine. Typically their gait is going to be more wide-based, it's going to be flexed over, as we talked about, and normally they'll be using some kind of an assistive device, and they'll normally walk with excessive ankle dorsiflexion. You can't really see that here, but you can in this picture. Look at that dorsiflexion right there. Excessive dorsiflexion during gait. Um, and there's also going to be, as we would expect, lumbar range of motion restrictions. Remember, these people want to keep their spine open as much as possible. And so if they go into extension, that's going to narrow the vertebral canal. They won't like that. And so these patients are going to have pain or restrictions with extension of the lumbar spine, and they're going to feel better in flexion of the lumbar spine. Now with side bending, quadrant motion, um, these can be positive for pain or negative, but the big things we're thinking about with lumbar spinal stenosis. They feel better in flexion, they like flexion. They feel worse in extension, they don't like extension. These other things we'll come back to as we go throughout the video. All right, some more details on the presentation. Right here, this is not a clinical prediction rule, but these are some important things to look out for for a patient with lumbar spinal stenosis. Typically, they're going to be an older patient over the age of 65. You would not expect to see lumbar spinal stenosis in a younger patient. So we're thinking the geriatric population. 
As we've already mentioned, their pain is better with flexion. That's why they stand and walk like this. And the pain is worse with extension. They're not going to like hip extension. They're not going to like lumbar extension, and certainly not hyperextension. What is their pain? Well, they're going to have pain in the back, right? It's lumbar stenosis, so of course they're going to have back pain. The back pain is going to become worse with extension. It's going to become better with flexion. And there may also be buttock and leg symptoms, okay? There can be pain in the buttocks. There can be pain below the buttocks, but generally with lumbar spinal stenosis, there is no pain below the knee. They will also have a negative straight leg raise. Okay. Uh, they may have some restrictions due to hamstring tightness. Even the best of us have that. But the point is they're not going to get any radicular symptoms, any pain into the legs radiating from the back due to the straight leg raise. And why would that be? When you do a straight leg raise, you're going into flexion of the hips, right? They feel better in flexion. Also, a straight leg raise tends to decrease the lordosis in the lumbar spine. They like that, so it's going to be a negative test. And then there's a couple constellations of things. One would be there some other aggravating factors. We've kind of already mentioned these things, and they have to do mostly with where they feel better, where they feel worse. They feel better in flexion, so there's going to be no pain when seated. Um, normally they'll be moving around, they'll sit down and feel better because the hips go into flexion. There shouldn't be any pain with flexion. Sitting is best. I think this all makes sense. And then standing and walking are the worst. Another thing with standing and walking that can help to rule in lumbar spinal stenosis would be the incline. If you imagine walking up a hill, do you lean back or do you lean forward? Well, when you walk up a hill, you're trying to shift your center of balance so that you don't fall backwards, so you lean forward, right? Patients with lumbar spinal stenosis are going to feel better with walking when it's up an incline. It's going to be a little bit worse when they're walking on level ground. And it's going to be very bad when they're walking down a hill. Why would you feel bad when you walk down a hill with lumbar spinal stenosis? Imagine yourself walking down a hill. You lean back to prevent yourself from falling forward. So you create more lumbar lordosis, more lumbar extension, and a little more hip extension. They don't like that. And so walking down a hill, very bad. Walking on level ground, kind of bad. And much better when walking up a hill. Okay, so those are some aggravating factors. And then this one, neurogenic claudication. This is big for lumbar spinal stenosis. Sometimes you can have symptoms that are similar to lumbar spinal stenosis, uh, but it's caused by a vascular issue. So if you imagine a blockage, let's say of the femoral artery, okay, well then all the tissues distal to the femoral artery that are supplied by it or its branches are going to become ischemic, especially as you start doing activity like walking. Okay. And so that would be vascular claudication. In vascular claudication, you can easily have pain past the knee because of the gastroc in particular. Uh, the calf muscles become ischemic when you start walking uh, for longer periods of time because they're not receiving adequate blood flow. But remember, with lumbar spinal stenosis, you shouldn't expect pain below the knee. So if you have someone who's presenting like a stenotic patient, and they have pain below the knee that's aggravated by walking, particularly in the calf, it's probably not lumbar spinal stenosis, it's probably just vascular claudication. Additionally, vascular claudication is normally unilateral, uh, because if you have a blockage in one femoral artery, it's just going to affect that one leg. It can be bilateral, but it's normally unilateral. Remember, with lumbar spinal stenosis, it's bilateral symptoms. Why? Because the issue is at the spinal cord. It's because the spinal cord doesn't have a lot of space because of the lumbar stenosis. So this will be bilateral, and typically both legs, the symptoms come on at the same time, but not below the knee. So a few things here with neurogenic claudication. Symptoms are triggered with standing, and symptoms are relieved with sitting. Okay? If we were to compare that to vascular claudication, the symptoms would be triggered by walking because that increased activity creates a, a greater need for oxygen for those muscles, but the claudication, that blockage of the artery, is preventing that blood from getting down there, and so they become ischemic and you get pain while walking. Okay? And in vascular claudication, the symptoms will relieve with standing, basically just not walking. They'll relieve with standing. In neurogenic claudication, the symptoms are triggered with standing, relieved with sitting. 
because you're going into flexion. Also, in vascular claudication, pain is below the knees. In neurogenic claudication, the symptoms are above the knees. There's no pain or symptoms below the knees. If you have pain below the knees, you have a positive likelihood ratio for vascular claudication of 20. This is a huge likelihood ratio. So if a person has pain below the knees, it's more than likely vascular claudication and not neurogenic. But then we have this positive shopping cart sign that has a likelihood ratio of 13, still pretty good. So if somebody comes in presenting like this, not with a shopping cart, but maybe with an assistive device, yeah, you're starting to think neurogenic claudication, especially if we have these other things right here. And that's this one constellation of signs and symptoms that are under neurogenic claudication. If they have neurogenic claudication, that goes hand in hand with lumbar spinal stenosis. When you think lumbar spinal stenosis, you need to think neurogenic claudication because this has a high specificity of 0.93. Meaning if somebody satisfies this constellation of symptoms under neurogenic claudication, there's a 93% chance that they have lumbar spinal stenosis. Okay, And so you'd probably treat it for lumbar spinal stenosis. But you of course want to further rule it in, so you do something called a treadmill test. And we're going to first look at this treadmill test, but understand that there's another bicycle test that's very, very similar. So this person right here is going to begin walking on the treadmill. It has a 0% incline. There's no incline. It's just flat. Okay, This is like walking on flat land. So they have upright posturing, and there's no incline. Okay, In this position, we're going to expect at some point within the 10 minutes that their symptoms are going to come on. Why? Because they're upright that brings on the pain with neurogenic claudication. Okay? And so we're just going to really measure either the distance or the time, probably really the time, although you could do distance, that they've walked to the onset of their pain. Then we do the same test, but now we put an incline there. So now they're flexed forward. This should feel better on the patient. Have a flexed posturing with that incline. We're going to expect them now to walk a longer distance or time before their onset of pain because they feel better in this position. Okay, So you have one in upright, one in slouched. And if the distance or time that they walk in the slouched position is greater than the distance or time they walk in the upright position, we're going to rule in lumbar spinal stenosis because this is characteristic of that neurogenic claudication, which means lumbar spinal stenosis. Notice here that the specificity is 92.3%. So if they have a positive two-stage treadmill test, which is what this is called, there's a 92.3% chance they have lumbar spinal stenosis. This isn't great for ruling out lumbar spinal stenosis. In fact, you'd probably rule it out with some of these things that we talked about earlier on. Okay, This is not great for ruling it out. You can also do what's called a two-stage bicycle test. It's basically the same thing, except you're doing it with a bicycle. Okay, So you first have them doing it in an upright uh, seated posture, and we're going to expect the pain to come on, on in under 10 minutes. That's your upright distance or time. Then we're going to have them slouch. The slouch is going to decrease the lumbar lordosis, meaning increased lumbar flexion. There's a little more hip flexion as well. And we're going to expect them to be able to go longer on this. So you can either look at the distance or the time. Same thing as the two-stage treadmill test. For the two-stage bicycle test, if they go a further distance or time slouched than they do upright, that's neurogenic claudication rule in lumbar spinal stenosis. All right, a few more things that you might see in a patient with lumbar spinal stenosis. These are by no means diagnostic, but they're things that can little by little help you rule it up if you hadn't done so already. Uh, right here, they're going to have segmental hypomobility. They're going to be hypomobile in the hips, the lumbar spine, and the T-spine. And again, you can just assess those with PAs, spring tests on the spine, and then passive uh, accessory mobility, PA, and other directions at the hips. They're chronically flexed forward at the hips, so we might expect there to be slight contractures in the hip flexors, rectus femoris and iliopsoas. Right? Also, because of the T-spine, they're probably going to be protracted, have a little bit of upper cross syndrome um, in the thorax and neck. So we might expect the anterior chest wall muscles to also be tight, like pectoralis major and minor. 
Also, the gastroc soleus, uh, the plantar flexors, are also going to be tight. Okay? Um, if you imagine this person is in dorsiflexion all the time, the gastroc and soleus are going to be always contracted to try and prevent that excessive anterior tibial movement, to pull that tibia backwards. So they're overworking the gastroc. It's going to be tight. Same thing with the soleus. Right? Uh, we might also have neurological changes. These are present in only about 20 to 50 percent of patients with lumbar spinal stenosis um, at one or more spinal level. And they can include weakness from myotomes, they can include the sensation. These are really just DTRs, monosynaptic reflexes. You could test the patella reflex, Achilles reflex. There might be some neurological changes, uh, but that is not diagnostic of lumbar spinal stenosis, but it's something to think about. And they may also have poor motor control and muscle performance. They can have weakness in the ankle plantar flexors, weakness in the gluteus medius and maximus. Why might they have glute weakness? They're constantly bent over. They're not doing hip extension. So those muscles are not going to be very strong. Okay? They might have difficulty activating the abdominals, in particular the transverse abdominus. They'll have difficulty with that. You might need to teach them some uh, techniques to activate that properly. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of the clinical presentation of lumbar spinal stenosis and how you rule in this diagnosis. In a future video, we'll go over some treatments uh, that you might use to help the patient gain more extension with less pain. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.